Food Service Power Plant Network. Yo, friends, and tonight is a special night. Not only are we in the Food Service Power Plant Network for the 50 or so people that generally end up with us every week, but we are streaming live into the K-12 Power Plant Network tonight that my friend Shannon Solomon, the director of Aurora Public Schools, runs and is is you know running with and motivating all that team and that community. So welcome tonight. It is our favorite night of the week, Monday night, where we get to interview a person in the industry who has left a mark, who is who is who has done something that has been profoundly neat, that has affected people in really cool ways and continues to do so and has set in motion these plans in their life to grow, to connect, to inspire, all these things, the three monikers of the Food Service Power Plant Network. And uh, tonight is a really good friend of mine. Dave Taplin is the owner operator of a Chick-fil-A out in Vegas and, uh, or near Vegas. And so, and, and we were together last week and we were hanging out, we we're having a barbecue at a buddy's place. And Dave and I, whenever we get together, we go a little bit deep. We talk about what we're learning, ways we're growing. And of course, Dave is doing these unbelievable things with his team in Vegas. And in COVID, they grew in pretty unbelievable ways and did some really cool stuff. I mean, so many of us know Chick-fil-A, the organization, the company, because you know, we have kids and we go there and we do what we do and it's fast and it's wonderful and they're kind and they're wonderful. And Dave is all of those things too. So we're going to talk about how he does that. Who's in the house? Todd Strader's in the house. Yo, Todd, what's up, brother? Uh, yeah, I would say Chick-fil-A is the best of the best. I love it. Dave is the same and we're going to hear his journey and his story. A couple of things for you as uh, friends, if you want, you can go to StreamYard forward slash Facebook. You can see Todd did that because we can see his name right there. If you want us to see your name when you're uh, connecting with us or making a comment, also, you're welcome to ask Dave questions. Throw them in the group. If you have any comments, any thoughts, um, any aha moments, or you've just got a question for Dave. Dave, I wonder how you guys do this, or how did you get through this rough time in your life? Throw it in. Um, it's going to be a blast. I'm actually going in the group right now so that I can see. Uh, there we are. So I can see everybody. There, I'm turning it down. Let's go find the man, Dave Taplin. Yo, brother. Hey, guys. Hey, buddy. How are you? Doing great. Glad to be here in oh, the flesh. Man. I am so, so glad you're here. I mean, you, you know, I've known you and your family for probably like 23 years. I think since probably 1997 or so was when... I met your family and we connected through Young Life and everything that we were doing. You, I, I guess you were still in high school, I think at the time. And um, to have watched you kind of in your journey and to stay close with your family. I mean, I, it's so funny after 23 years, all of your family are still my friends. I see your sister for barbecues every six months. And, you know, it's just, I love when those relationships can stand the test of time, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, it's... Uh... <clears throat> Uh, just for all the uh, for all the viewers out there, um, just so you guys know, it's uh, he tries to keep it unofficial, but Jason is actually uh, professional status on Can Jam. It's a backyard <laughs> game, but I got to have the honor of being on his team. And let me tell you what, <clears throat> Jason is a shark. He'll he'll throw it he'll throw it through that slot. He'll hit it right on twenty one. I think we won. We won three straight games together, and Dave, we and, crushed it, man. It was great. Let's just be clear. I think that your back was sore at the end for from carrying the team. I'm pretty sure that your back was sore. It takes two. It takes two, Dave. One has to throw it. One has to knock it in. Todd mm -hmm. Strader knows Can Jam. Great game. Totally. Yeah, Dave and I played against a couple of old college buddies the other night in the street outside of one of our buddies' houses, and it was uh, it was an epic night. I mean, it was kind of surreal. Um, Dave and I, we need to play together. We're obviously on the same page. David Maxwell's in the house. David, what's up, my friend? It's good to see you. I hope things are great in the Carolinas. Um, okay, Dave, uh, I, I'm excited to share a night with you, buddy. There's already people that have questions. Before we get to people's questions, I want you to tell us your story, your career journey, because you know, you, you've had a pretty awesome career journey in terms of you. It seems like from my perspective, you can, you can clarify this. You know, years ago, you knew what you wanted. You knew where you were going. You know what you wanted to be a part of. And it took you a lot of different places to to get where you want to be. And now you're in an unbelievable place doing really cool things. Can you just fill everyone in on on your career journey, you know, kind of out of college and, and how you got to where you are now? Yeah, I'd be glad to. 
So I'll, I'll start in, uh, in college, college time. And, uh, <clears throat> so funny, I, my major was, uh, exercise science. So I wanted to, my, my hopes and dreams were to be a college strength and conditioning coach. When football ended for me, I missed the workouts more than I missed the game. Huh. So that's what I studied in college. That's what I got my degree in. That's what I went into. Uh, I worked at a company called Velocity Sports Performance, um, who very few of you may uh, know and remember. It has since gone out of business. But um, <clears throat> funny story, I got to uh, train Christian McCaffrey and his brother or brothers when they were um, probably in the single digits because wow. Eddie McCaffrey trained at our facility as well. Huh. And uh, uh, loved strength and conditioning, loved all things exercise science. But uh, the company that I worked for went out of business. And so I wanted to use my degree. And I, uh, I ended up working at a, a corporate fitness company out west and doing personal training and becoming a fitness manager. At about that same time, I met my now wife, Dana. And throughout our journey together, we've been married for 15 years. We just celebrated 15 in January. Uh, well, <clears throat> my, my greatest advice is to marry up. It has served me very well um, to be married to somebody who challenges you every day. Hmm. So we have five kids together throughout the process. Um, uh, Holland is 13, Hudson's 11, Hayes is eight, Haddon is six, and Hawkins is two. Wow. So we have, uh, uh, I'll get the story going here a little bit more, but uh, we've moved 16 times in our marriage. Uh, a lot of those moves were for Chick-fil-A. Some were before that. Wow. but. Uh, my wife, Dana, uh, who has her master's degree in counseling, um, she's a clinical, clinical counselor and a therapist. She, um, when I got in, eventually I'll get to this part of the story, but when I got into Chick-fil-A, she basically put her career dreams on hold to, um, to get us to where we are now. So, um, I, I am certainly not a, a self-made man. And uh, I just want to give a shout out to my wife um, for everything that she uh, has, has done for us. So in 2005, basically all at the same time, this company that I did um, strength and conditioning for went out of business. I, I, my car got hit, my car got totaled, and um, I got engaged to my now wife, Dana, all, all in the summer of 2005. And um, so I ended up doing um, personal training at a corporate fitness company out West and uh, became a fitness manager. So I got some, some great leadership experience doing that. Um, I still love fitness to this day. Uh, you'll hear me talk about it a lot. It's one of my, one of my favorite hobbies to do. I love sports. I love exercise. Um, and I learned a ton of things uh, in the fitness industry. I, I learned um, it was the first job that I ever worked on commission, any type of commission. Uh, as a matter of fact, I tell people it was much more of a sales job than a fitness job huh. where I worked. Um, but I, I learned how to, um, I learned how to really earn, uh, for lack of a better word, um, not that people who who don't work on commission don't have to earn things, but. Um, if I didn't, if I didn't sell, then I didn't get paid. And, um, I, as much as I loved fitness, uh, after about six months with this company, I knew that it was not going to be a career for me, but I was accustomed to a lifestyle is what I like to tell people. And, um, and the money was, a was a big reason why I stayed, even though I knew that it wasn't, it wasn't who I was, uh, how we did business was not who I was. And um, so in 2007, at this point in time, uh, Dana and I are, are living in Colorado Springs. And um, Dana, I, I grew up in the West. Like, uh, Jason, you, you're from Colorado, right? Philly, I grew up in Philly. I moved out here for school. Forgot. Um, well, I grew up in, in uh, Boulder County. So we didn't really have Chick-fil-A. We had one at uh, Crossroads Mall, <laughs> about 30 minutes from our house. And um, so I didn't. I didn't, I didn't know much about Chick-fil-A really, but my wife grew up in the Southeast and she grew up with, uh, with an owner operator's family. One of, one of his daughters was her, 
one of her closest friends. And so she introduced when, when I started to date my wife, I basically started to date, to date Chick-fil-A as well, because we would go on dates to Chick-fil-A and I fell in love. I fell in love with the brand. Um, at the time, I didn't know what their core values were. I didn't know what their purpose or their mission statement was, but I, I loved how the food tasted. I loved how I was served. I loved the hospitality. I could sense it. I could feel it. And um, in 2007, I decided to do what many people do these days. I went on to the website. I went to www.chickfilet.com and uh, I expressed interest to become an owner operator. At that point in time, in 2007, there was about 20,000 people a year that did that. Um, and you had never worked there, Dave? Never. Okay. But you just knew you wanted, you wanted to be an owner of one of these locations. I, the, the fitness company that I worked at basically shared a parking lot with Chick-fil-A in Colorado Springs. And, um, I would take my lunches there. I would read my leadership books there. I remember I, I took one of true at Kathy's books and I started a book club with my personal trainers. <laughs> that was literally the first book that we used. Wow. Yeah. It's crazy. Why would somebody in, in the fitness industry want to, want to flirt with fast food? And, um, but I was in love. So, um, I applied and Chick-fil-A said, no, thank you right now. We're not interested. And so I said, well, I guess that wasn't meant to be. And I went right back into the fitness industry and doing my, continue to do my thing there until May of 2009, when I actually lost my job and I was let go. And, um, I remember initially at that point in time, so this is, this is 12 years ago. I, I got into provider mode and I said, and at this point we have one child, we have Holland, our, our daughter. And I said, honey, honey, I can get a job at American furniture warehouse. I've got a brother that works there. I can get a job at Invesco. Uh, my brother works, my, my brother-in-law works in the stadium. Um, I can get a job at Starbucks. I can get us benefits. Yeah. And thankfully, um, my wife, was wise enough to um, have us go out on a date. I remember going out on a date and, and she slowed things down and she said, what do you want to do with your life? Not what do you, not how do you want to fill the gap, but yeah. what do you want to do with your life? And I said, honey, the only thing that I've wanted to do for the past two years is Chick-fil-A, but they said, no. And, and she, she knew that there were other ways to uh, pursue this dream because as it turns out, um, about 70% of Chick-fil-A owner operators started out as team members, even to this day. And so um, she got me in touch with, a, uh, with an operator. There was, there was a, an owner operator in Greensboro, North Carolina, who did youth ministry with my father-in-law. And so I, um, I gave him a call and went through the interview process with him. I told him, I said, Hey, I want your job. Uh, I don't, I don't want to take your job necessarily, but I want to <laughs> do what you do. <laughs> and he said, uh, he said, I can train you and show you everything that I know. I can't guarantee you um, that you're, you could do everything right and still not become an operator, but I will show you everything that I know. And I said, great. So um, in 2009, uh, July 13th was my first day as a, as a team member at Chick-fil-A. In 2009, we moved from Colorado Springs, Colorado to Greensboro, North Carolina, and I became a Chick-fil-A team member. And in order to make this happen, <laughs> in order for my wife to continue to be a stay-at-home mom, we moved in with my in-laws <laughs> Got it. and literally got pregnant with our second child that week. <laughs> we moved Holy in. cow. <laughs> so we're expanding our family. I'm learning how to be... Um, learning the ropes at Chick-fil-A and uh, ended up being a blessing um, uh, to kind of speed things up. I, I was a, a team member for and a manager at Chick-fil-A for two and a half years, did some grand openings during that time. And then I became uh, what is now called an interim manager, which basically is um, a, an interim corporate operator that goes into corporate owned Chick-fil-A's, which only, which basically only exist in between ownership. So if an owner retires or passes away, 
um, then an interim an interim manager comes in and stewards shepherds the restaurant to get the next until the next operator takes over, which basically was a pipeline for me to eventually apply and become an owner operator myself. So Dave, how often does someone who steps into that role when, when you go into a location and you're kind of walking them through a tough time, they're sort of without the leader they've had, they're figuring out who the new leader is going to be. How often does that person become the new owner operator? Very rarely at that specific store. Okay. Got it. But if you get into this program, this uh, interim manager program, which is very competitive as well, um, then you probably have about an 80% success ch chance of success to become an owner operator. Cool. Cool. By the way, going back on a pre on that previous statistic um, in 2007, when I um, applied externally to become an operator, uh, there were 20,000 applicants a year. Um, I just checked a couple months ago for the year of 2021 this year. Come and on. as of May, there was already a hundred thousand <laughs> expressions of interest. Holy cow. And that's only that's only people who are not <clears throat> people who are not in Chick Fil A already, because there's several hundred thousand team members of in in Chick Fil A, and many of those are also applying. And there's about 150 new opportunities a year. 150. Wow. Holy cow. 150 something like that. So yeah. Um, just uh, at times it was a very daunting process. And, and so, uh, I, I interim managed, um, five different locations. So I was a team member for two and a half years. And then I was an interim manager for a year and a half doing, uh, five different locations. These are all part of the 16 moves that I was talking about earlier. This, these all go into that during that time we had our third child Hayes <laughs> on the road. Um, I told you we, we've had five kids. Yeah. <clears throat> we've actually had five children in five different States. Wow. Wow. So, um, eventually I, I applied to become an owner operator during that interim manager process. And they, they said yes, um, to a low volume mall Chick-fil-A opportunity in Mesa, Arizona. Yeah. And so I was at superstition Springs mall in Mesa, Arizona as the operator from, <clears throat> excuse me, um, July, 2013 until, November of 2016. And during that time, we were able to grow, we were able to grow the, the grow the business. And, uh, at that, at the end of that time, um, there were still five States that didn't have Chick-fil-A and one of them was Nevada. Hmm. And so the Nevada location opportunity became available. And the question that we couldn't answer was why not? Why would we not do this? Yeah, uh, Vegas is almost an extension of Phoenix. It's four and a half hours away. The climates are similar. The people are similar. Um, we didn't have any family in Mesa. We don't have any family in Vegas, but um, it, has, it was a tremendous opportunity. And so we applied and Chick-fil-A said yes. And this isn't me. What I'm about to say next is, is certainly um, not me. It's the brand. But... Um, that that grand opening weekend and month, we set uh, grand opening records that still stand to this day. Whoa! People people waited um, an hour and a half or two hours for a Chick Fil A sandwich. The drive through line at one point got up to two hundred cars long. Wow! Uh, the anticipation for the brand was enormous. It was outrageous. People had been driving for years and years and years. People had been driving to Utah and California just for Chick-fil-A. And um, they were so excited to have their own. It was, it was an amazing experience. Wow, Dave. It's, it's just, um, it's, it's cool to be on a winning team is what I would say. Chick-fil-A was great long before, um, long before I ever got here. And it'll be great long after I leave. Um, but it was, it's just been such a tremendous opportunity and, um, what, uh, it's just funny because, uh, I went from fitness to fast food. 
<laughs> you know, that is funny, but, but I mean, you must believe, I mean, you care about your body. This we know, I mean, your career story, uh, every time I see you, you could, you know, kill me with like a handshake if you wanted to. Um, what, talk about that. Is it, I mean, obviously you believe in something and you run a store of, of food you believe in. I know that's just what, who you are. Um, I mean, I'm, you guys do it. Well, you and I talked about cooking things fresh a lot the other night. So talk about, talk about that transition to being, you know, such a health buff and, you know, running a, a, a fast food location. So, uh, what I think what attracted me the most to Chick-fil-A ultimately, ultimately was the values. Yeah. Um, if, if you, if you want to be great in, in, uh, food, uh, <laughs> Serve great food with great service. Great food, great service. It's very, it's very simple. Hard to do, but a simple concept. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I when I fell in love with Chick Fil A, I didn't know the I didn't know the corporate purpose. But if you were to drive into uh, the corporate headquarters, the home office at fifty two hundred Buffington Road, Atlanta, Georgia, and you get to the front double doors, etched in stone to the bottom. Down, down on, on the ground at, at the bottom right is the corporate purpose. And it's two sentences. And it says, to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that he's entrusted to us, to have a positive influence on all who come in contact with Chick-fil-A. Hmm. And there's just not many for-profit companies that have a purpose like that. Sure. That exists for that reason. And that and the mission and the core values are all things that just drew me in. It was. Um, it wasn't about um, drastically in, increasing people's caloric intake. <laughs> it was about hospitality. I fell in love with the hospitality. I knew. I knew how I felt when I was at Chick Fil A. I wanted to make people feel that way because it feels so good. It You're right. So good. You, you, I mean, going to Chick Fil A. I mean, our family goes. Our kids love it. We love it. Um, the it creates a feeling. I, I get excited to go through the drive through and for someone to say what, whatever the, go, uh, yes, sir. You know, Oh my gosh, what do they say when I'm done? You know, it's my pleasure every time I need something. I mean, the hospitality to your point and the way people genuinely care and they want to take care of the customer, it feels great to go there. Absolutely. Yeah. People, people will not always remember what you say. They won't even remember what you do but they will always remember how you make them feel. Heck and so yeah. we, we want to create remarkable experiences for people. I love it. Uh, by the way, our buddy Charlie's on Charlie Rob is on Marsha's on values are so important in all aspects of our journey. Heck yes, Marsha. I mean, I remember when I took the job with Cal mill, when um, I'd been talking to them and we'd been going back and forth on some stuff and they sent me the offer letter, uh, Cal Mill where I work and, and at the bottom were their values, which I'd never seen before. And, um, and, and it was, you know, we are, um, we do the right thing. We are humble. Um, we, we're, we value simplicity, all these things. And I showed it to Shannon and I'm like, babe, you've got to see this. Uh, this is, this is what we are. Like, this is, this is where, this is where we belong. And, um, and it, there's something about values that keeps you on point. You know, it's easy to get, get lost in whatever moment or whatever crazy. I mean, you serve 5,000 people a day on average. It's easy to get lost in the hecticness and the busyness. But when you've got those values and those things, those deci decisions become a heck of a lot easier. Yeah. The, um, how Craig Gro Groeschel likes to say it is, um, the most attractive and inspiring thing about a leader is centeredness. And when it comes to, uh, when it comes to being a centered leader, it's, it's hard to define sometimes, but it's impossible to miss. We can, we can tell pretty easily when somebody's not centered. And, um, on the, on the contrary, when, when somebody is centered, they're grounded, they're, um, they're humble, um, they're secure in who they are. Um, they're, ple <laughs> they're pleasant to be around. <laughs> Um, and so we all need to be centered. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dave, who was, who was that quote by? Uh, Craig Groeschel. Man, I love that. You know what? I think actually, um, I think that's Kathy Langlois. He's, does he have a leadership podcast and he's also 
like a pastor? He is. He pastors Life Church in Tulsa, and he 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 does have a leadership podcast. That's very good. I've heard it. Kathy in our group recommended it to me, and it's awesome. Uh, by the way, Todd says you have the best chicken sandwich ever. I get, uh, which I agree with. I get spicy with like the stuff on top, just for what it's worth, in case people are wondering. Uh, Marsha is in love with the chicken minis. Marsha, outstanding. Um, that's it. Maya quoted how they made you feel. Gosh, isn't it always about how someone or an organization make you feel? It really is. Um, waffle fries. Oh my gosh. Those waffle fries are addicting. I mean, that and some Chick-fil-A sauce and you've got me, you know, you had me at waffle. Uh, Rick Palmer's in the house from Nashville. What's up, Rick? Centered, his sentiments exactly, centered, grounded, and humbled. Heck yes. Uh, Marsha loves it. Something to work at. Staying centered. Todd's number three. Spicy Deluxe. Deluxe. That's the word I was looking for. Todd, I love it. This is outstanding. Um, okay, Dave, In, in during COVID, COVID hits. And... Um, we're all wondering what's happening in the world and what's happening in our businesses and, um, your store, I don't, you know, I'm assuming Chick-fil-A in general, but your store grew, you found a way to grow, to grow. Tell me what's going through your head. Kind of when COVID hits, you own this location. You've got a lot of team members. How many team members do you have at your location? Between a hundred it varies, but between 140 and 150. Okay. So you've got a lot of people at your location, friends of yours, people that you're teaching, that you're working with, that you're training, and the world sort of stops. Um, what are you thinking at that moment? And then how quickly did you and the Chick-fil-A team, it seemed like pretty quickly, bob and weave and decide, all right, here's how we're pulling this off. Um, drive throughs galore, ramp them up. I know the one near our house. So I think they added two more drive throughs And um, tell me about that process a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think if there was one word to describe 2020, it would probably be unprecedented. Uh, just so many, so many things happened for the first time for basically everybody who's alive right now. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> change is inevitable, but growth is optional. And um, everybody's going to experience change. Um, but you have to be intentional to experience growth. And so as, uh, as, as many people saw, and it wasn't just us, it was, it was a lot of, a lot of restaurants in the brand, but, um, your oftentimes our growth is only limited by our imagination. And, uh, so for one of the things that we did is, um, we were forced to shut down at a, at a certain point in time. We were, uh, and sometimes we were held to a quarter capacity, 25% capacity. And, and so we ended up keeping our restaurant dining room closed for, uh, from March of, uh, 2020 until we just opened it up, uh, June 9th of this year. And, and so that's, that's a lot of change. Um, that's, that's very different than what we had been doing. Yeah. So we made our parking lot a drive through We extended our drive through into the parking lot. And um, where we had been um, doing, uh, gosh, let's say our peak car count hours previously may have been 140 cars in one hour. Um, we, we pushed 300 cars through in an hour. Wow. Um, and uh, we, we, so we basically had two channels, two, two channels of business, one being the drive-through and one being uh, delivery. Okay. We still do delivery through our delivery partners, and then we we do our own Chick-fil-A delivery as well. Um, but uh, it we invested in $1,000 of cones, <laughs> made some professional signs at Office Max, <laughs> built some um, some posts uh, with some quick creed and some, some buckets, and um, changed our, our setup sheets to, um, to, to see what we could do with um, – with more staff and just a drive through and no dining room. Wow. And, um, and, and we grew our, our business, our business went up 25% in 2020. Wow. And, uh, that's, that was an uncommon, that's not an uncommon number, uh, for Chick-fil-A, um, in 2020 Chick-fil-A Chick as a brand grew 
in 2020. And you've got to understand too, that, um, I don't, I don't know what the exact number is, but, uh, somewhere around 10% of Chick-fil-A restaurants are in malls, malls and inlines, and they, they don't have drive throughs right. And some, some of those malls were closed down for a good amount of time. And even with those closures, the brand was still up last year. Wow. And, um, I think, I, I think one, a, a, one or two really important points is, uh, John Wooden, the uh, former coach of the UCLA Bruins, um, still holds the record for the most men's, uh, national basketball championships. He was quoted as saying, um, when opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. Hmm. And I think what, what, what we need to, with all the things that happened in 2020 with COVID and, um, with the social justice movement and things like that, uh, if you want to be impactful and influential, it's best if you already have a seat at the table. So thankfully for us, we already had a drive through when COVID. Um, thankfully for us, a year previous, we had already started our own delivery service through Chick-fil-A, through the app. There's wow. select Chick-fil-A's that do that. Not all Chick-fil-A's offer that. Um, it's an operator's choice and we chose to do that. And so we were in a good position. We were in one of the best positions possible to experience the change that COVID brought. And so it's, it's as much as possible, we wanna already have a seat at the table. We wanna, we want to expect change uh, another example, so one of the things I try to do with our leadership team at the restaurant is I, I try to train leaders 12 months before we ever need them. So I try to, so for our leadership bench and, and in our industry, obviously we have a higher than average turnover because it's quick service food. Um, and so I, I need to have a big bench of, of players that I can pull off. And we aim to train and develop our leaders 12 months before we actually even need to promote them. Because we have, we want to be ready. We don't want to be shocked. We don't want to be shocked. We want to be disciplined um, before the time comes, so that something doesn't have to discipline us. Because that's, that's basically how it works. <laughs> Either we can discipline ourselves, or something else. We can wait for something to discipline us. So, um, twenty twenty was a very hard year for many people, and I respect that. And I know that people have, m most people have been through a lot. Um, Thankfully for us, 2020 was a very, for, for the most part, 2020 was a very big blessing for us. And um, I'm very thankful for that. I'm very thankful. When you talk about Dave, um, and I'm going to get to some guests, we had some people ask questions earlier, but when you talk about leadership, you've got a big bench. You are training people 12 months before you anticipate needing them. Talk about, talk about your leadership training with your team. When you and I talked, you blew me away. I don't know how many leaders you have. You can tell me that, but you said for every everyone who qualifies, kind of as a leader, your training, you're bringing up. You offer what is it? One hour a week to, of kind of connecting, sitting directly with you. There's a there's a book program, right? You guys read a book together, and you're learning and you're growing. Talk about that process that that you implement with your leaders. Absolutely, I, I believe that the best ability that all of us have is availability is actually being there for somebody and uh time is really it's the most valuable thing that we all have and so it's normally the last thing that we choose to give um it's uh, there's plenty of people that are generous with their time with their money but aren't generous with their time and it's much it's much more difficult to be generous with your time yeah we normally only give uh our time to the people who earn it who we feel earn it from us and so um, I, uh, at, this, at this point in time, I've been doing this for a couple of years now, but uh, I have 25 leaders on my team and I offer to meet with all of them uh, individually for an hour a week. And so during that time, I don't pay them uh, their hourly wage for that time, um, nor do I pay them to read the leadership books that I give them. I do pay for the leadership books that I give them to read. Um, just as a gesture, just just to show some kindness. But I, um, what I want them to understand and what I want them to feel is that I would run through a wall for them. 
I would run through a wall for them. I would do anything for them. I want my, I want my leaders and my team members for that matter, even though I, I don't offer my team members as much time. But I want them to know that they can ask me for anything. And I, I want them to know that I have their best interest in mind. I think we all know that quick service food is a transitional restaurant for most people. And so I, I try to tell them that from the beginning. I know that for, for many of them, it's a launch, I want it to be a launching pad. I don't want to lose team members. I want to launch them to the next level of life, whether that's their 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 dream job or their dream college or they move away to get married or whatever it is. I want to launch them into that next phase of life. And so um, uh, to, to influence and to coach them, I give them this hour a week. We, they have, they have a, a leadership book that they're going through. We're going through at least a chapter a week. Um, I tell them that it's their time. They can... They ultimately, they need to set the agenda. I have my uh, thoughts and questions that I'm bringing to the table, but um, I will work as hard. I, I will run through a wall for them, but I will never work harder for them than they work for themselves. That's one of the things I tell them hmm. to make sure that um, they have skin in the game, that they are driven. And I, I never, I'm never going to meet <laughs> with anybody who I have to drag along. Sure. Who, who I have to say, okay, um, did you read that book this week? Um, did you did you answer all the questions? Did you come prepared? No, this isn't. <clears throat> this is a big boy and big girl job. We're not. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not a babysitter. That's not what I do. Um, but I do consider myself a coach and a teacher. Hmm. And um, both John Wood and Tony Dungy said the same thing about hiring leaders. They both said that they would never hire a leader who wasn't a good teacher. And that was the very first quality that they looked at first. And that's, that's a quality that you possess, Jason. That's a career that you, um, that you know. And, um, and so I, I believe the same thing when I'm, when I'm looking for leadership talent, um, I'm looking for teachers. I'm looking for people who, and, and the thing with teaching is you haven't taught until they've learned So hmm. as the title of teacher doesn't mean that they're a teacher but you haven't taught until they've learned. If they learn something, if you've influenced them, then you're a teacher. And so um, teaching and coaching is so, is so important to me, giving them that time. And um, for me, I'm, a, I'm an introvert. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm way more on the results side than on the relationship side. And so for me also just to have those connections just to um, build that trust in those relationships and literally to, for them to know that they can, they can talk about anything, anything with me that they want to talk about. Um, I, I, I want to help them in any way possible. I want to add value to their lives. I don't just want to make them better at Chick-fil-A because I know that they're going to leave Chick-fil-A at some point. And, uh, and I, I want my footprint to be positive on them and my, my fingerprint, I guess I should say. Um, to be positive. And <clears throat> so that, that's, that's one way. Another way is that um, we offer a, uh, we offer a free three month course. We call it uh, our leadership intensive training. We, because, because we wanted a cool, uh, <laughs> a cool acronym, L-I-T, LIT. We want to call it LIT. <laughs> so um, We offer LIT, the leadership and training course um, to all of our team members but you have to apply to get in. We have to accept you. And what we do for 12 weeks, this is, this is not the hour long training that I do with my leadership. This is for team members who are not titled leaders yet, who are interested in leadership and who, the, and who want to show, um, who, who want to show their desire and to show and is, good. Is this big Chick-fil-A Dave, or is this you in your location? This is just our location. Got it. Okay. So every, every Chick-fil-A is different and how they do leadership and structure. And so we, we go through three leadership books during that 12 course, during that 12 week course. Um, basically half of the time we spend on <clears throat> the principles in the book. The other half of the time we spend on Chick-fil-A specific things, whether that be bottlenecks or uh, profitability or food cost or whatever it may be. Um, but in 12 weeks, we are able to see whether these people have enough passion to continue to read these, continue to read these books, continue to do their homework because there's other pre-assigned homework as well, um, 
And then after, after these 12 weeks, we haven't paid them to do this class. We, the, how we pay them is by giving them these books, then giving them our time to do this class. It gives us a great snapshot of their momentum as to whether or not they will become a leader for us or not. And so when I talk about the 12 months in advance, <clears throat> that's a great way of, that's a great snapshot of how we can see who could be a great leader for us. And it's not, it's not perfect, but it's, it's been a pretty good process. Dave, it sounds like an amazing process. And I mean, the amount of, we always talk about friends, if you're watching, I hope you've got a notepad and a pen because Dave, you've dropped some bombs on us tonight. Um, like, you know, who is this? This is, I brought I think this is Chris rolling. Uh, great nuggets of wisdom. See what I did there? Well played, Chris. Uh, well played, Marsha. Showing your team that you have their best interest at hand in all times is so important. Launching them into their future, I think that's awesome. I would agree. I mean, some of these, I mean, I, I taught for eight years. I taught teachers, and I love that phrase. You haven't taught until they've learned. And that's so important to ask, to follow up at the end of it. You know, it's so easy to get up and, and say whatever you want to say, but then not ask any clarifying questions and not ask, what have you received? Like, what have you retained? How are you going to take that and change and learn and grow? Oh my gosh, Dave, this is awesome. Um, before we keep going, I want to honor everybody that asked some questions to our friend Katie Stowe. Um, and, and you've touched on this a little bit, Dave. What are your go-to strategies to motivate your team to provide great customer service? Hmm. Great question. <clears throat> so first of all, I would say encouragement always wins. Um, <clears throat> so encouragement always wins. Um, so first and foremost, do, do, do I care about my team or not? And does sure. my team know that? Um, I think they do. I, so I, I'm just going to start with basics here because there's, there's, uh, obvious ones like, uh, bonuses and things like that, but, uh, we've got to get back to the basics first. So one of the things that I like to do is, is initially when I'm coming in through the door, there may be 20, 30, 40 people on the clock. Um, but I want to say hi to everybody. I want to look them in the eye. I want, I want to call them by name. Right. Uh, pre COVID pre COVID, I used to give a lot of them hugs. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> changed. Let's change a little bit. Um, so acknowledging them all, um, showing them their value. And then in the same way, when, when I'm about to leave at night, um, if I'm on my game, then I'm saying bye to everybody as well. I'm looking them in the eye and I'm saying goodbye and I'm, I'm taking time to do that. Um, uh, also it's important to remember we we manage everyone the same by managing them differently. Hmm. So what motivates some does not motivate others. That is that is something that is tried and true. You yeah. cannot, uh, some people want the recognition, some people want the pay. Some people want the um, uh, the the other benefits, um, whether that's uh, you know getting their phone paid for or um, uh, we did a taco truck once for our team <laughs> to celebrate our team. Nice. Um, yeah, that was uh, that was good. We were going to do a during COVID. We we're going to do a movie day, a, mo a movie night for for our team. We we're going to rent out a movie theater. Um, but don't don't ever miss don't don't ever miss the obvious. Um, every every member of the team wants a leader who who they can trust, who who they know cares about them. And who cares about results? Hmm. And if you do those three things, you're going to inspire your team. Heck and yeah. The rest is kind of creative. I love but it, Dave. Popsicles or a bonus. I love that it's so personal and it's also so universal. I mean, a lot of the things you mentioned are true for just, just darn near any human. You know, this is Shannon. Or encouragement always wins. Everyone always loves to hear when they've done a great job to support them, to pump them up, to tell them you've got this, whatever that takes. She's, uh, you're right. She's right. I am a hugger, by the way. Absolutely. You know this. Um, what, I mean, you talk about customer service. I mean, Chick-fil-A is legendary for customer service. I mean, is it, is, is there like a special, you guys have all your special sauces. I'm a Chick-fil-A sauce guy. We have like a big tub of it. I don't know where Shannon gets it, but we have a big tub in the, refrigerator. 
Um, is it is it like Harry Potter magic? What you guys do? It doesn't. It seems like fairly elementary things. You're just unbelievably kind to customers, and you're able to do your job quick to take care of people and make them feel good. I mean, is it rocket science, the way you make customers feel? Well, I appreciate that. No, it's not rocket science. Uh, right. years, years ago, Dan Cathy, the, uh, the CEO of Chick-fil-A, um, coined a phrase, um, and he, he took it from the Bible, wherein uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, um, somewhere between Matthew chapter 5 and 7, uh, Jesus tells uh, a story about um, he 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 alludes to um, the rule that under under the Romans the uh, the <clears throat> the Jews or anybody were required to carry a Roman soldier's pack for one mile. <laughs> so two thousand years ago, that was the rule that if a Roman soldier asked you to do that, you had to. And Jesus said. Um, <clears throat> If a if a if somebody asks you to carry the load for a mile, I want you to carry it for two miles. Hmm. And so, Dan Kathy said, "We are going to be committed. We are going to be committed to second mile service. So we are going to we are going to go the second mile for our guests." And the thing is, is no, that's not rocket science at all. I think we all I think we all know that. Um, some some very basic second mile service we we know that but it doesn't mean that we do it right basic second mile service behaviors could be refreshing beverages clearing trays carrying large orders to cars those are really basic things some of the more uh behaviors that that take more effort that i've seen are changing flat tires for guests um we uh, certainly, when, whenever, I, whenever in our restaurant, whenever a, a guest comes through the drive-thru and they've forgotten their wallet, we take care of the meal, no questions asked. Huh. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, um, uh, one, of, one of my team members um, lost her dad um, to COVID two days ago. And... Um, this this doesn't do that justice at all, but um, just right off the bat, um, we contacted her, let her know that we were praying for her, um, offered food for the family, um, bought a big gift card to um, DoorDash so that she can just order the meals when she needs to, um, took her off the schedule immediately um, so that we can get her ships covered and, and completely take care of that. Um, any, any, the, the majority of these things, the, the majority of these behaviors are really just in our mind and in our hearts, um, going the second mile for somebody. And the question really is just, is, is, are we going to act on our warm hearted impulses? Hmm. You have a warm hearted impulse. Are you going to act on that? Are you going to do something about it? Because if not, then we're going to be like the rest of quick service food or the majority of quick service food for that matter. Not all of them. Some, some of them do a great job where it's just transactional and, and not, not an emotional connection. Wow. We want to, we want to emotionalize. We want to emotionalize with people. We want to make a connection. And so going the second mile is, is very helpful for that. Well, emotion, it goes back to what you said earlier. You, you know, how do people feel after they've left you? I mean, that's, that's emotion right there. That's a memory. It's so funny too, because I think about a lot of the moments I, as I've studied things we remember in our past, there's a lot of things we don't oftentimes things, even from when we're two or three that we recall, uh, they're often, often moments that have a, um, pretty extreme emotion tied to them, right? Whether really good or really bad or scary or something that you don't want to go back to, or something that was really fun. You know, oftentimes if you can connect emotion to an experience for someone or to a learning, chances are they'll hold on to it longer. I, I, I love what you're doing. Um, you um, you serve on average, when you and I talked, you all do about 2,500 tickets a day. On average, you assume that's two people per ticket, about 5,000 people going through one location, which is mind boggling. Um, you're one of your, one of the things we talked about is you wanna serve the freshest food fast. Mm -hmm. How do you manage 
to take care of that many customers while caring for them, by the way, while get, making them feel a certain way. But how do you get that many customers and, and give them all fresh food? I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing that you're able to do that. What's the thought behind it and some of the process? Yeah. As leaders, we need to, we need to be able to embrace dichotomies. Um, so basically the, the dichotomy is a whole into two parts. So the, the two ends of a whole. And so that, that, and this allows us to take our service to the next level. So for example, um, some people would say, well, do you, do you want fast food or do you want fresh food? And the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> both. <laughs> yeah, we're going to, we're going to do both. Um, we are going to cook less more often. Hmm. Another, other, another one is, um, do you want fast food or do you want an accurate order? Yes. <laughs> we're, we're going to do, we're going to do both. We call it the power of and we call it the power of and we want to be the best. We want to be the best. I don't want to say at all things because I don't believe anybody's the best at all things. But if we're going to be the Disney of fast food, then we need to have power of and because there's there's a lot of things that we need to be good at. There's a lot of things that we need to be excellent at. And so, and again, why would we limit ourselves? A lot of times people just, pe people are limited by their own imaginations. Yeah. By how far they think that they can only go when they can go a lot farther, a lot farther. So, um, another thing I'll share that's been helpful for me is, uh, and I don't know who to attribute this to, but just so you know, I did not make this up. <laughs> um, it's just a, just a, a, uh, something I picked up, but, um, it's called the three P's, the three P's. So <clears throat> when I'm thinking about my leadership, um, when I'm thinking about, about my influence and even reflecting on my day and making improvements, the first P is personal. Um, what did I do? Well, what could I have done better? Mm -hmm. The second P is uh, personnel. How is my team? Did I, did I have the right people on the bus? Did I have the people on the right seats on the bus? Do I need to get more people on my bus? Do I need to kick somebody off my bus? And then the third P being uh, process or procedure. So do we have a process for cooking less more often? Do we know how many chicken fillets to cook in a 10 minute period. Yeah, we do because the brand has invested a lot of money into that process, but it could be any of those three P's to make the change, or it could be something in all three of those P's. Sure. I love it that you're focused on all, because they all, I mean, it's like a triangle. Um, you know, there's never just one thing you're considering all those things as you're figuring out how do we accomplish this task? I love the power of and. You know, so often we've had, we had, there's a big, uh, we've talked about in our group at different times. We've had a few, a lot of really significantly powerful and amazing women, moms, and who are significant leaders in our industry. And there's this belief oftentimes amongst younger women that I've heard that, well, I don't, I don't know if I can be a professional and a mom. It's, it's either or, and, you know, well, it's possible to be both. There are people that, uh, are doing both in our industry that have led the way that are doing it now. So I love that your answer is yes, we are going to find a way to do both. We don't have to sacrifice. Now, again, you can't do everything perfectly. You know, you choose your battles, but um, we can serve fresh food and we can do it fast. We can serve uh, fresh food and we can do it or fast food and we can do it accurately. I think it's really important and, and it's so good for all of us to look in our lives and ask ourselves, are there things I sacrifice because I believed maybe not accurately that I couldn't do two things well for whatever reason. Um, I can't be a, a professional, successful professional and be a very engaged father. Um, I can't be a, a, a professional who travels and stay healthy and exercise, right? All these things that we think are on opposite sides, but the power of and. I love the power of and. Marsha is in. She's loving it. It is so good, Marsha. I am... Dave, you are dropping bombs tonight, man. This is so awesome. Um, you should write a book. Just saying it. I'm going to leave that with you. Um, okay. David Maxwell, our buddy out of the Carolinas, who built a Chick-fil-A store, by the way, 
He built a chick. I had the honor a few years back to build a Chick-fil-A on the campus at North Carolina State University. Awesome, David. Here's this question. If you could go back and give your 20-year-old self one solid piece of advice, what would it be? Well, first of all, uh, my wife graduated from North Carolina State, so go Wolfpack. There you go. <laughs> awesome. So, she, thank you, David. I'm sure she, uh, I don't know when that Chick-fil-A was built, but if it was built uh, by 1999, she says, thank you. And I said, <laughs> love it. Um, yeah, I, I, I love this exercise because it's a, it's a great perspective question. And 80% um, of Chick-fil-A team members are under the age of 21. And that's, that's brand, that's chain wide. So we have a very young staff in general, and they say that the majority of uh, major life decisions are made between the ages of 18 and 25. Hmm. And our, so that just goes to show our team members are so, uh, so influenceable. And so I, I get to share this answer a lot with a lot of our team members. Hmm. And I, I think the number one thing that I, that I need to put out there is, um, there are going to be so many changes in the next 20 years. Don't worry about what people think about you. If, if you have, a, if you have a, a decision to make that's going to either impact your, if it's going to impact your character positively, but it may not in, impact your reputation positively, choose character. Choose character. Start building that character, right? Start building those disciplines. Start building those habits now. Yeah. But don't don't worry about what makes you look cool. <laughs> I I don't look cool. I still don't look cool. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you, Dave. Right there with you, brother. <laughs> like I, I, um, I mean, seriously, I, uh, I get it. I get a haircut every three to five months. I, I've got gray hair. Um, the only time I have new clothes is when my wife buys me new clothes. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't keep up with style very well. Thomas Jefferson once said that in in matters in matters of style, swim with the current. In matters of principle, stand firm as a rock. Hmm. And we start start building the things that matter early. Right. Uh, David Maxwell, maybe, maybe you're related to John Maxwell because John Maxwell, the leadership author says that he can beat, and he's, he's told Olympic athletes this before he can beat any Olympic athlete in a hundred meter dash. As long as you give him an 80 meter head start. <laughs> That's awesome. So it doesn't matter. It, it really, in life, it doesn't matter who's fastest it does matter who gets out there first. Hmm. It does matter who gets out there first. I love it, Dave. You, you know, you talk about values, you talk about character. You're, you're right. You and I both know this, the change comes that, that things, uh, you know, life happens sometimes and things you don't see come in and you need to bob and weave and you make changes and you alter plans for the sake of what matters um, and what you've decided matters. And sometimes it's a, uh, uh, you know, the power of, and, you know, there's lots of things. And sometimes there's your one thing, there's the thing that you choose. There's a, you know, rock you need to stand on and um, something that you say, listen, if all else fails, we're going to be this. I know in our family, a couple of times I left my business a year and a half ago um, because the, you know, two things after 13 years were no longer kind of working anymore. And it was, okay, what's the most important thing here? And uh, we are going to keep doing life as a family. And so we're going to make some pretty dramatic changes in all else. Um, and uh, so I, I love that that's, that's what you teach and that's what you tell. And, you know, walking through 16 different homes you've lived in or places you've lived or in, in 15 years of marriage. I mean, I'm sure it takes having those things that you and Dana trust in and your character, et cetera, to help you through all that and all the new people you've met. Thank you. Um, okay, last. I'm going to, man, I can't believe how quick this went because we need to wrap it up in a minute. But Glenn Lawless, our buddy with Metro, and we talked about this. I think, Dave, you've got some Metro at Chick fil A, don't you? We have a lot of Metro. 
Yes, I love it. Uh, Glenn, I hope you're watching. In the last three to five years, what new belief, behavior, or habit has most improved your life? So I'm sure it's been recommended on, on the show a lot, but um, one of the most impactful books recently, I, I wouldn't say the most impactful leadership book in my life, but certainly recently has been Atomic Habits by James Clear. Mm -hmm. And he does a really good job of uh, going from a goal to a process to an identity change. And so, um, so case in point, let's say that you have two people, both of these people were severely overweight and they, they both lost a hundred pounds. One of them was goal oriented. One of them was identity oriented. The goal oriented person is dr driving down the street. They see the hot light come on at Krispy Kreme. They smell those fresh donuts and they say, Hey, I hit my goal. I'm going to reward myself. They drive up, get a baker's dozen and enjoy. The identity oriented person lost a hundred pounds. They're driving down the street. They see the hot light come on. They smell those fresh donuts, but they say, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop at Krispy Kreme right now hmm. because I'm a healthy person. And, and maybe if I stopped at Krispy Kreme, <coughs> I wouldn't be able to have just one. And so I'm just going to keep driving because that's not what healthy people do. Healthy people don't overeat. And, and so then I think of, of just who I am, who I am, who I am as a father, who I am as a husband, um, who I am um, in my relationship with God, um, but who I am. Because people of integrity, if I'm a person of integrity, then I'm, I'm the same person on this show that I am as soon as I sign off and I'm with my kids in a few yeah. minutes. Um, that I am at work, that I am at church or anywhere else in the community. I am, the, I am the same person because that's who I am. I'm not trying to be somebody that I'm not. And so um, we, we truly need an identity change. Um, we need to identify in a healthy way. It's not, it's not good enough to have a goal. It's not good enough to, to just have a process even. A healthy process can be very healthy. But I am all for healthy systems, right? Systems don't break people break, mm -hmm. but there has to be an identity change. I, I didn't, I didn't know what Chick-fil-A's values, mission and purpose were when I fell in love, but I knew that there was something different about it, about Chick-fil-A. And what, what the deepest parts of me, what's, what's in my heart matches with what Chick-fil-A believes with, with, with their identity, my, our, our identities, match. There is similarity there. And so we, we need to have, um, we need to have an identity change. If you want to have a lasting change, if you want to have a lasting positive change, you need to have an identity change. Love it, Dave. I love it. Um, real quick, last question, um, debating between two. Um, when the folks at Chick-fil-A one day you're, you're, you're doing what you do. You're doing it successfully. You got a team of 140 to 150 people. You're training, you're leading, you're inspiring, you're launching all of these things that you're doing, which are amazing. When, when your peers in your Chick-fil-A community one day look back on your career, what do you hope they say about, you know, what Dave Taplin meant to your community and, and, both in Vegas and to the Las Vegas community. I would, I, I would say that I, I would hope that they wouldn't say much about me. Um, mm -hmm. I would hope that they would say a lot about my kids and um, about my team members. Um, and, uh, and about our guests, um, <clears throat> nobody, nobody can argue. Nobody can dispute the changed life. Whenever, whenever someone's life has been changed, normally people, normal people, people pay attention. When someone's life has been changed, 
normally that's an alert. Um, and when people, especially when people have positive change, when they have positive change and when they say, I want that, what do you have? What do you have? I want that, that you have. I, I love when I hear parents in the community say, I cannot wait for my daughter to turn 16 to come and work for you. I cannot wait for that moment. That gets me so excited. That makes me feel so good. Um, and so <clears throat> I, I hope that the, I hope that the significance would be, um, m my kids, the, the team members and in, in the, uh, the community that was changed. I love it, buddy. I think it's beautiful. Um, man, you've, uh, You've touched some people tonight. Wow. Identity change. I love that, Dave. I think that's my bride. That's Shannon. Loving it. Marsha, great advice. Time for an identity change. It's really, it really does resonate. Um, you know, we have goals. I set goals in my life, but oftentimes I set them because there's something deeper I want. There's a, a vision of whatever I hope for, whether it's a new sense of identity in an area of my life or a different perspective or you know, whatever it is. And you're right. If you're just setting goals and you accomplish them and you go back to the person you were, um, then, then what's really changed in you and how long lasting can it be? I love, I love identity change. Um, Dave, a couple last thoughts. Um, I want to share with you some of, um, you've affected a lot of people and a couple of them, I'm not going to rat out the person that connected me, but, um, but a couple and I, a couple of them and I connected and they shared some thoughts on you and what you've meant in their life. I, this is where I always get emotional. Um, so I'm going to read you from a few of your colleagues and friends who are grateful for who you are in their life, Dave. Aubrey Gary. I met Dave almost three years ago, coming up this September. I'll always remember my final interview with him before he hired me because he never broke eye contact. <laughs> Dave has been a mentor for me since we met. As I went from a front of the house team member to a front of the house leader, to a back of the house team member, to a back of the house leader, to a floater over a whole restaurant. I love these terms. Dave has helped me in my personal relationships. He's encouraged me to move forward in my life and brought me closer to God. He encouraged me to start going to Hope Church, which has changed my life. I'm very thankful that he never stopped asking me to come to church. Dave is someone I consider as a mentor and a friend, not just my operator. He spends the time to meet with me twice a week for an hour each to talk about leadership and study the Bible. Dave is someone who I've definitely thought about having officiate my wedding. I'm very thankful for his grace and his truth. He'll always have a strong impression on my heart. Ryan Roberts. Dave is a gentle giant and a titan of industry all rolled into one incredible package. I love that phrase, a titan of industry and a gentle giant. Dave is a servant leader who cares deeply for others. And I'm always inspired how Dave has embraced the calling that God has on his life. Dave has been a great friend and a confidant for nearly 10 years now. And I'm a better person because of our friendship. That's so good. I don't know how you got these, but this feels great. <laughs> Joey Bocci. You and I might know a guy. <clears throat> Dave Kaplan is one of the most incredible leaders I know. He is a servant leader. Second time that phrase has been used. His commitment to intentionally spend so much time with his leadership team shows his commitments to each of them and his business. As a person, he is generous. He is selfless. He is disciplined. And one of my best friends on the planet. The only thing I don't like about him is that he lives so far away. <laughs> and Travis Terrell. I hope I pronounced that right. Dave is one of a kind. He shows consistent, real humility, as well as caring for people. To me, he is a friend, a mentor, 
a partner in business in addition to being a great boss. He exemplifies the values of Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A's corporate statement is to be good stewards of all that God has entrusted and to have a positive impact on all who come in con contact with Chick-fil-A. Dave is a true example of this vision lived out daily. Brother, you, uh, look, man. It's amazing. It is amazing, right? It's so good. It's amazing what, um, when people like you, who've chosen to live certain ways, who care about identity, who care about people, who focus on their community and focus on launching people, um, who focus on leadership, who care about character and values, and you fell in love with an organization. Um, it's amazing what happens when all those things come together. Dave, you're someone who is always learning. You're always growing. I watch you. I mean, all these nuggets of wisdom that I wrote down tonight um, and your ability to pass those on to people. I understand why moms and dads want their 16 year olds to come work for you. Um, the, uh, those comments don't happen if you're not paying attention to the things that you are and you're not living the life the way that you do. So, you know, from a grateful community of those friends and from me, just, you know, let us say thank you. It's truly my pleasure. Thank you for saying those things. <laughs> I don't know where you got them from, but it felt great. So thank you uh, so much. You got it, buddy. Thanks for joining us tonight, Dave. Um, honest to gosh, for giving us an hour. Thank Dana and the kids for giving us an hour tonight of your time. Um, so many nuggets of wisdom for everybody. Um, I hope you got great things. Food service, power plant, community. I hope you were taking notes. There are so many great things. I have a feeling some of our upcoming quotes are going to be from Dave on our quote cards in the morning. Um, listen, you know, Dave is an amazing example of connecting with something, knowing what you want to be a part of. You know, Dave's wife, Dana, asked him that question. Not how are you going to fill the gap right here and make sure we're fed, but what do you want? Um, where do you want to be aligned? And understanding that first in your life or, or, or thinking that through helps set you up for whatever amount of perseverance it takes to keep going and be aligned with your dreams and your goals and either organizations or a vision you have that moves you, that inspires you, that has values that align with yours to help keep you on course. So I think it's step number two in becoming a food service power plant. Decide what you want to make. Um, you know, listen to Dave's journey tonight. He's lived in 16 different places and 15 years of marriage to pursue something that's really special and look at the effect it's had on both him, his family, and his community. Um, don't give up whatever that dream is. It's so easy to uh, have an either or experience. Dave talked about yes and or both and the power of and. Um, you know, yes, you can figure out a way to, to, to pay your bills. Yes, you can figure out a way to have your day job and you can pursue a dream, whatever that is. Hopefully your day job is your dream. But if not, both and, the power of and. Um, don't give up on it. Continue to go. Um, look, we always remind you you're stronger than you realize. You're capable of more than you know. There is always more strength than you. There is always more courage. Whatever it is that you hope to continue to uh, build up inside, it's there. It just takes a little digging and cultivating, maybe building some atomic habits to help develop them. So keep going. And if you're in a particularly tough spot, uh, drop any shame around that. It's easy to look at the world. Things are coming back. Dave's business is up, you know, we're, we're getting back out, we're traveling and to say, gosh, there's so much good around me, but I feel like I'm in a particularly tough spot. Uh, don't shit on yourself. There's a reason that you're in a tough spot and it's okay. Dave and I have both been in some pretty tough spots in our journey. Um, your job is to keep moving, hold on to that belief, continue to pursue the dream, keep moving. If you need to connect, if you re resonate with Dave, reach out to me, I'll connect you with Dave. If you need a person to talk to, you can reach out to me. There's so many people in our community that are willing to talk and listen. Just keep going, and that light will come. That light at the end of the tunnel will come for you as well. Food Service Power Plant, I'm so glad you joined us. We'll see you the rest of this week. Remember, if you are going to NAFM, go find in the events our invitation. You can go RSVP there. In fact, I just added tonight the room. We just got the room. I think it's 206 A and B. We'll have about... 200 of our closest friends at our party at NAFM, which would be great. 
if you or your organization want to sponsor the Food Service Power Plant Party, uh, turns out the food and the drink all cost money. So we would love it if you want to partner and be aligned with something special and positive. Everything the Food Service Power Plant represents, we'd love to have your support. Come sponsor it. That'd be awesome. And uh, next week, we will have Brian O'Rourke from Oneida Hospitality joining us. Many of you know Brian, so that should be fun. One of the neatest people in my professional journey. So he'll be joining us. Everyone, lots of love. Dave, thank you once again. Thank you, my friend. And God bless all of you guys who are watching. Thank you. You got it. Everybody, lots of love. Have a great night. Bye.